is up, NetCast? Good morning. Bon dia, bon dia. Everybody doing all right? Wow, I like that. Bon dia. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Breno. I'm one of the pastors here at NetCast. I've been serving here for the past eight years of my life. Absolutely love it. I am honored to be part of this congregation, to be part of this family. And it's awesome to be here this morning. I, um, usually you see me up here with an instrument or without a, an instrument, but with a mic on my hand singing. Uh, today we're not going to do that. Um, I am going to preach, and I am slightly terrified every time I do this. So, uh, you know, as you listen, pray for me. Um, it's Memorial Day weekend, you know, more than just a holiday. This weekend we, uh, we remember and honor those who have paid the ultimate price serving our nation. And if you are currently serving or have served we honor you this morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> Again, another major American holiday, and you're here with the Brazilian pastor. And that's been a theme in the past, I guess. I guess I'll be preaching again on 4th of July or something like that. <laughs> Bad. Yeah, that's just a joke. Uh, anyways, uh, um, last week, guys, we're, so we're in the book of Daniel, right? Last week, Pastor Matt shared a very powerful word out of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 3. It's a very iconic text, very iconic story of the three Hebrew young men that refused to bow to the golden image that the king of Babylon uh, had commanded everybody, and they were thrown into a fiery furnace to die. But did they die? No, because God saved them. You know, God jumped right in, right in with them, and the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, got to see right there in front of his eyes the power of the Most High, the God of Israel. And he got to then recognize that the God of Israel is, in fact, the Almighty God. So that was last week. Today, we're moving on into chapter 4. Um, and it's a lot of verses, guys. Lot, there's a lot of verses here to read. So guess what? I'm not going to read it because English is not my first language. And even if it was, I'm not a great reader anyway. So for your sake and for my sake, I'm, I'm going to read some, but then I'll tell most of the story. And, uh, you know, if you think I'm making this stuff up, first of all, that's wild, you know. But you can also go and ch fact check me later. It's Daniel chapter 4. You can read. And then if you have questions and if you want to criticize, you can send me an email. Well, please don't do that. That's lame. That's so lame. <laughs> Just trust me. This is from the Bible, okay? Um, a fun fact about this chapter is that this is a collab between Daniel and the king. It's the only time in the Bible that a Gentile king narrates a story. So the king starts the story, and then Daniel picks up in the middle of the story, and then the king wraps it all up. Um, so let's read. But before we do that, can we just pray real quick? Let's do it. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you for bringing us together this morning, Lord. I pray that uh, your word would come through me, and, and, and I, I pray that you would just take over this room, uh, prepare the hearts to receive the word, Lord. I, I, I lay down all my insecurities, my thoughts, my own opinions, Lord, so that you can just do what only you can do in this room and touch the hearts of your people for your glory in Jesus' name. All right, so let's read some. I'll start right at the top. Verse 1 says, it starts like this. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, languages dwelling on earth, peace be multiplied to you. It seemed good to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prosper in my palace, palace, and I saw a dream, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw a dream that made me afraid. So, so far, Nebuchadnezzar is chilling at the house, 
at the crib at the royal palace and has a dream, and he is terrified. So naturally, he invites all the wise men to come and give him an interpretation. Naturally, nobody was able to do until our boy Daniel walked into the scene, and guess what? He was able to give an interpretation. I'm going to tell you that what this dream was. So basically, this dream was a vision of a massive, glorious, majestic tree. Tall, high. It, the Bible says that the, in the vision, its top reached the heavens, and there was fruit. And this uh, big tree provided you know, um, sh- uh, shade and also shelter to animals. And it was this beautiful thing. Then the dream continues, and the king saw this messenger coming from heaven with a message, with a decree, and he wanted to you know, let the, the king know these things. And basically what the messenger said was, chop the tree down, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be, gi- be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. Then Daniel, in verse 19, is alarmed. He hears that, and he is alarmed. So basically, the king says, Daniel, just give it to me, man, like... You know, just give it to me. I can't handle it. Well, Daniel goes, I wish this was for your enemies, but it is not. It's for you. The tree is you, and the sentence that you heard is from the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. Well, let's read verse 25. That you shall be driven from man and be with the beasts of the field. You'll be... you. Um, sorry, you'll be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven until you know that the most high rules the kingdom of man and gives it to whom, whom he will. And then Daniel goes and gives the king some advice. He says, break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your pers- prosperity. Let's now read what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar uh, next. In verse 29, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in his mouth, a voice spoke from heaven saying, The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men and dwell with the beasts of the field, and you will eat grass like an ox until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of man and gives gives it to who him will. Verse 33, immediately Nebuchadnezzar was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like birds' claws. That is wild. My man just turned into a werewolf right there. <laughs> now, eventually, some time passes by. He's out there with, with the beasts of the field. And eventually, he comes back to his senses, lifted up his eyes to Jesus, to, to God in that moment. Uh, and he recognized, gave glory to God. His kingdom is now given back to him the moment he, de- he says that, and also more greatness is added to him once he repented and gave glory to God. Now I'm just going to read the very last verse, 37, that says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, pray and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to to humble. There's a lot here, guys. There's a lot in this text, but I, I would like to focus on five main points that I believe God wants to communicate with this congregation this morning. 
And the first is this. Your testimony needs to be told. Your testimony needs to be told. The text starts with Nebuchadnezzar saying, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations, and languages. Then he continues, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High has worked for me. Nebuchadnezzar had a story to tell, and he wanted everyone to know. Listen, if you call yourself a Christian, you have a testimony. You have a story to tell. Not just a random story. You have the most powerful story to tell. You need to, you need to know that, and you need to remember that constantly. Think about your life before you met Christ for a second. Think about all the, the deep despair of not knowing God. Think about the loneliness. Think about the, the lack of peace internally that you had to just live in on a consistent basis. Think about the insecurities, the fear of tomorrow. Remember that? Now think about your life today and the peace and the joy that God has given you. Not only that, but the hope for a future that transcends this earth. To be with him through eternity, that's amazing. Listen, your story, your story carries power. Your testimony has power in it. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says, <clears throat> And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. You see the power of your testimony here? Your story can lead other people to Christ. You know that. Your story can lead others to find the most beautiful hope. To encounter the person of Jesus Christ that can come through your story. Remember that. Your story needs to be told. Your testimony needs to be told. Another thing to know is that when you share your testimony, you're ultimately giving glory to God. It's his story. You're not telling a story of how great you are. It's quite the opposite. You're telling his story. He's getting the glory. That's why the enemy wants to shut you down and be like, no, 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 just keep this for yourself. You know, that's, that's, I know people are going to laugh at you. It's like he knows the power that your story carries because he knows that ultimately God is getting the glory every time you share the things that God has done for you. So share your story. Now, if you're here, you're like, who is this guy? Who is this Brazilian guy that's like, you know, preaching today? Let me give you my story in 45 seconds. I was just a broken teenager, you know, so insecure. I had no idea what life was about. I was hopeless. I used to joke around with my friends saying, hey, you know, I just want to do as much drugs as I can and play music and die at 27 of overdose, that'd be a dope way to go. How dumb is that? Very dumb. Look where, like, I stand here today as a husband, as a father of three, redeemed by the Lamb of God, bought by his blood. Listen, God has changed my life completely. He's done that. He can do the same in your life too. See, that was like a minute. It's not hard to share your story. But that can be highly impactful in someone's life. So share your story. Don't let the enemy shut your voice down. Don't let that happen. Okay? If you have a story to tell, please tell it. All right. As I was preparing this week, and I was thinking about this, like, why don't we share our story? Why are we not sharing our testimony? I was, re I was reminded of the words of David in Psalm 51 that he, sa he says this. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore in me the joy of my salvation. And I think some of us, if we're honest, we just, we lost the joy of our salvation. You know, it's easier for us to walk around just complaining and like looking at the things that we don't have and playing the comparison game than it is to just look back and be grateful and let that joy of your salvation be what drives you. So maybe here's where you start today. Ask the Lord, just like David did. It's okay, you know, like life happens, and sometimes we get distracted, and we lose sight of where God's grace is playing a role in our lives, and we just, we lose it. It's fine. We just need to know that that is reality for us so we can fix it. Just like David did, he says, restore in me the joy of my salvation. Let that be your prayer today. Lord, restore in me the joy of my salvation. Now let's turn our attention to our boy Daniel here and his posture towards the king. So Daniel's response to the dream is very interesting. The punishment that was about to come upon the king was was troubling to him. Now remember that Nebuchadnezzar was the man who kidnapped him from his land, emasculated him, forced him to serve in his own court. This was also the man responsible for the destruction of the holy city of Jerusalem and the slaughter of so many of Daniel's fellow countrymen. But there was no delight on the prophet's part. Daniel was not pumped about it. There was no delight in that destruction in Daniel's heart. How interesting is that? And you know why? Because Daniel was living a life of love. And that's the next point. You and I should live a life of love. As simple as that sounds, that's hard to do. It's so hard to do. Look, it seems like a genuine affection had grown between Daniel and the king. Daniel had accepted that the Lord had had placed him in that position. And he kept his faithfulness. He was trying to do his job to the best of his ability. Daniel lived a life of love, a love for God in the first place. And that love allowed him to love the lost and do it well. As followers of Christ, we must understand that this world is not our home. We're exiles waiting for the day when Jesus will bring us home. But while we wait... We must live our lives seeking the best for our nations and praying and seeking the welfare of others around us. Very important. Like Daniel, we are here to love and to show and to show the truth of God's salvation to all sinners, all sinners. That includes the people that vote different than us, the people that think different, that look different the people that hate the church, people that are very hostile to Christians. We're called to love all of them. Now, I'm not saying we're we're not called to agree with them. We're not not called to uh, support their views. None of that. But we're called to love them because that's what God did when you and I were lost in our sin. He loved us. We live in a very divided society. There's an election this year, so things are going to get worse, you know, on social media. There's like, listen, man, there's not one discussion online that you look and those back and forth that, you know, that you look and you're like, yeah, that's so full of love and light. (laughs) People are mad hateful out there. Listen, people are bigger than, you know, their votes or whoever they're voting for like just see people for what they are they're they're sons and daughters of the living god made in his image and you and i our first response needs to be love is that clear does that make sense easier said than done but let's try um and then We go to our next point here. 
which is the main idea of this text. All right, so the shortest format of this story will be something like this. There was this big, you know, arrogant guy. There was a big deal somewhere. And he got absolutely smashed by God until he recognized that there was only one true God and then gave glory to him. And then he ended up, all, all was well with him at the end of the story because he gave glory to God. So that's the super compact form of this story. And the central idea here is that God will humble the proud. God will humble the proud. God has a problem with pride. And it doesn't really matter how much society is trying to glorify, sanctify the concept of pride. It is a bad thing. It it is a sin. And pride will destroy you. The Bible says that God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Listen, it is good to be humbled every once in a while. Let me tell you that. It is good to be humbled, to face the reality and come to, con- to the conclusion that we are not that great. It's great for you. It's healthy. You need that. Let me tell you, uh, recently I joined a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym. And uh, after a long period of inactivity, I went back to the gym. You don't understand how humbled and humiliated I was in that mo- like on that Monday night, the first training sesh that I went to. Guys, let me tell you, um, during the warm-up, I, w- I was deeply concerned already. <laughs> uh, like, it wasn't even like, it was just warm-up. Like, jumping jacks and everything, I'm like, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. It was so humiliating to the point that my wife, she called the gym during the class, and she was like, hey, guys, you know, like, you know, my husband is there. I don't, I don't know if this is a good idea for him. How humiliating is that? <laughs> she didn't have a faith that I could do it and survive. I was like, you know that they're not going to kill me, right? She was like, eh, I don't know. So I was, I, I, I decided, it was dumb. I decided to roll with this 17-year-old kid. And I was like, I know, I got this. I got this. 20 seconds go by, and I'm tapping. I was like, no, 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 we'll do it again. Boom, 10 seconds. And then this, the third time, I'm like, no, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this right. And I'm there, and then, like, I don't even know how that happened. He was on top of me. He was grabbing my head. He was squeezing my head so, like, so strongly I could hear, like, his, like, from his chest, I could hear, and I was like, this, this cannot be good. (laughs) One thing I did fantastically well, tapped every time. I was very good at that. Right? (laughs) Gotta do it. Anyways, that put me in a position to learn. That helped me really understand where I was in the journey. Very, very, <laughs> oh boy. Um, but that, that gave me motivation to continue, to learn, to, put me, to humble myself and be like, no, 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 I got to listen closely. I got to learn these things before I think I can do anything, right? And that's how it works for us in our lives. You and I need every once in a while to be humbled. I'm not talking about toxic relationships where people are just abusive. They, I'm not saying you need to stay there. You need to get out of that relationship immediately. What I am saying is that when you're feeling good about yourself and you're feeling like you're the man, you go and you're, it's healthy for you to be humbled in that state, to be like, eh, I ain't, I ain't that great. That's good. Listen, God's patience is great, but it's not unending. God's patience is great. It's not unending. For the unbelieving world out there, there will come a day when sin is so great that his punishment and his judgment, his final judgment, 
will most certainly come. Nebuchadnezzar represented this most, he, he represents the most powerful, the most successful, the most feared person. No one dared to say no to him. Everything he wanted, he had it. He had riches, treasures, influence. In his mind, there was no one higher than him. Even after witnessing the power of God in multiple occasions, he still chose pride. He, was, he, he basically stands on the rooftop and he says, look what I've done for myself. Ain't this great? Look how great I am. This is a very praised phrase out in the world. I've done it for myself done it look at me listen it's not that you need to suck at all all the things that you do no you need to be excellent and you need to be striving for you know uh to be a better person yes that's all true it's your heart when you think you don't need nobody and that you're better than people that is the problem that is what i'm talking about here the bible says that while he was still speaking the, the words were coming out of his mouth. The Lord's discipline comes upon him. He lost his kingdom immediately. He was driven away from among men and became basically a werewolf, eating grass with the animals. Don't you forget for a second that the Lord knows your deepest, most hidden motives of your heart, and he will deal with that. In love, but he will deal with that. Which leads us to the next point. Unchecked sin can turn you into an animal. Unchecked sin can turn you into an animal. Guys, since we're in the, in the era of AI, right? I decided to give it a try. And you're like, where is this going? Uh, I decided to give it a try, and I asked one of those AI image genera- generator things to uh, generate an image of a madman covered in hair, eating grass with an ox. And this was uh, the result right here. It's pretty impressive, right? This was kind of like the vibe that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, found himself in. Like this, from the majestic king to something like that. that. That is what sin does to us. Here's what we need to understand. We're created to live in, a sub, in submission to God. When we choose to live a life of sin, we're moved by our desires and impulses. We, we lose our humanity. And then we start existing in this very animalistic state. And it is the saddest, most depressing, lonely, lonely of places to be. Paul talks about it in Romans 1 says, therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. If you are living a life of sin, unchecked sin, hidden sin, listen closely. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to turn your ways. You need to seek help. Listen closely. This might be your last warning. Stop ignoring the Holy Spirit and take this opportunity today. There is hope for you. There is grace for you. There is mercy for you. But don't continue on that life. It's not going to end well for you. There is still time today Change your ways. Seek help. Come to the light. And Jesus will meet you there. I promise you. Not only Jesus, but this church was going to receive you with open arms. We want to walk with you. No one is going to, you know, cast shame on you. I know I'm not perfect. I have my own mistakes. I have my struggles too. We understand that. But stop hiding 
Stop hiding. No one is too far gone that God cannot bring back. Lift your eyes to the heavens today. If Nebuchadnezzar could do it, you can certainly do it. Which leads us to our next and last um, point here. Choose praise over pride. You see, the text starts with Nebuchadnezzar giving praise to God. He loses his way along the way. And then it ends with this. And I'll read to you verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. When you look at your life, when you're at the rooftop of your life, looking at all your accomplishments, all the great things you've done, let me ask you this. What do you see? Do you see your own greatness? Or do you see God's greatness? Is your response praise and gratitude? Or is, your, or is your response pride and arrogance? There's nothing wrong with accomplishing great things. There's nothing wrong with that. I believe we're called to accomplish great things. That's facts. But don't take the glory. Don't take the glory. Choose praise over prize. Maybe you're here today and you're living a life of sin. Maybe you feel like you're, you've lost your mind already. And you're living with the animals. Maybe your personal kingdom is falling apart right now. Or maybe you feel like you're at the top of the world right now. Or maybe you feel like Daniel that is in a position where you often have the most unpopular convictions and everyone around you seem to operate in a different system. I don't know where you are in your journey. This is what I know. The call today is one. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Praise the Lord most high. And honor the one who lives forever. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He is the one that can bring you back from that very animalistic state and restore your humanity. He is the one that can restore the kingdom back to you. He is the one that walked down this earth here, lived a perfect life that you and I could never live, a life of humility to the point of giving his life up on the cross for you and me. But the beauty of the gospel is that death didn't have this, the final say. Jesus rose back in victory over Satan, sin, and death so you and I could have life and life abundantly. That's why we're here today, guys. Because of the work of of Jesus Christ. My prayer is that we, that we would be a church that is quick to share our testimony, share our stories, share of God's good, goodness and greatness. That we'll be a church that walks in humility, a church that lives a life of love, and most importantly, a church that is constantly choosing praise over pride. Let's pray. Lord, we recognize that only you can change our hearts. So we thank you for this word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the beauty of the gospel. We thank you for grace and mercy. 
Lord, I pray for those under the sound of my voice that are like wrestling right now with coming, you know, coming out of the darkness into the light, saying, hey, you know, I've been living a certain way. I pray for those right now that they will be able to overcome the lies of the enemy, saying that they're not going to be loved, that they're not going to be accepted. I pray against that, Lord. I pray that they, they will listen to your Holy Spirit today, repent, confess, and find free, freedom. Lord, I pray for those that they're here, and for the first time, the message of the gospel is making sense. I pray that they'll be able to put their trust in you. And I just pray that this church would just walk in humility, choosing praise over pride, sharing the good news at all times so that you can get the glory of Jesus. We love you. Thank you. We praise your name. Pray these things in your mighty, beautiful name. Amen. Hey, listen, now we're going to have a time of response. We usually have communion, but today I just want you to take, take your time. Be honest with yourself. Process what we just talked about. And listen, if you're here and you want to put your faith in Jesus for the first time, it's pretty simple. You're going to pray a prayer. You're going to talk to him with your own words. And you're going to say, Jesus, I put my trust in you today. I believe you are who you say you are. And I give my life to you. That's it. That's it. That's where your journey starts. All right? Let's worship and I'll be back in a second.